knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men. The shadow knows. <laughs> Once again, the thrilling adventures of the shadow, the hard and relentless fight of one man against the forces of evil. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. Now here's important news for all college men interested in flying. How would you like expert training at the Navy's famous Pensacola, Florida flight training school, the Annapolis of the air? Well, for the first time since the war, the Naval Aviation Cadet Training Program is open again. Once more, those Navy wings of gold, the ensign's commissions, and the high pay are being offered to qualified young men. Naval Academy selections are being made now, so if you're single, between 18 and 25, and with at least two years of college, you're eligible to apply. For full information on how to get into this drilling program, visit your nearest Navy recruiting office. And now to the shadow. The shadow, who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and mysterious secret. The hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, Dead Man's Ride. On a rise of land, overlooking a secluded valley, stands the elegantly appointed one-story manor house of Roundville the celebrated horse farm of wealthy George and Helen Warren. This late afternoon, we find a tired, somewhat nervous woman talking low and insistently while a doctor listens attentively. No, it isn't exactly a happy marriage. George and I have never been in love, in the true sense of the word. My stepfather was wealthy and ambitious socially, and he wanted me to marry George because of the... Well, the prestige of the one in me. I see. Now, uh, suppose you tell me something about your stepfather's death. Please, Peter, do we have to talk about that? My dear, you must remember this isn't the general conversation, but an important psychiatric treatment. I know, Peter. And you've been so kind and patient and helpful. It's been wonderful having you here for the past two weeks. I want to see you well again, Helen. I want very much to see you well. I'll do anything you say, Peter. Well. Now, suppose you tell me about your late stepfather. You weren't exactly on friendly terms, were you? No, we weren't. He had forced my marriage with George. I, I didn't like that. But his death did come as a terrible shock to you. Well, not exactly. No, it, it wasn't exactly a shock. I see. Where were you precisely at the time your father fell from the horse and was trampled to death? Why, I was... Yes, Helen, dear. Tell both of us. George. Where were you at precisely when the so-called accident occurred? I didn't hear you come in, George. Obviously. Or you and the good doctor wouldn't still be holding hands, would you? George, stop being ludicrous. You're drunk. Drinking is my vice, isn't it, Helen? And yours is psychiatry. Or is it something more dangerous? Something to do with horses? George, Aaron, I won't have you upsetting my patient with your ridiculous accusation. Ridiculous, Doctor. Helen's word is ludicrous. You two should stick together, Dr. Stark, shouldn't you? I think we've had about enough of this. Isn't that your horse waiting for you just outside the door? Yes, Doctor, that's Bruno. I'm riding him this afternoon. You're riding Bruno? Yes, the horse is perfectly safe. Providing no one tampers with the saddle straps before he's mounted... What do you mean? I mean that saddle straps left unbuckled can throw a rider. And Bruno loses his head when he sees his rider on the ground. He tramples them. Like he did your stepfather, remember? George, please. Are you going to uh, jump Bruno today, George? Jump that wild stallion? <laughs> Why, he's tough enough to hold on the flat. But it wasn't so long ago that you were boasting about what a fine jumper you were going to make of him, George. 
Yes, he seems to have changed. He's become, uh, shall we say, more uh, cautious, if that's the word for it. You think I'm afraid to jump that horse? I'm not afraid of any horse in the world. I'll jump him and I'll come back and laugh in your face. Here, here. I thought this was a sick room. What's all the excitement? Hello, Father. You're just in time, Mr. Warren. George is going to jump that crazy Bruno horse for the first time. Jump Bruno? No, George, I won't let you. Why, that's the horse that killed Helen's stepfather. Father, well, I've made up my mind. And just in case you two would like to watch the performance, there's an excellent view from this large window. Oh, George, you can't. I forbid it. A fool. He'll kill himself. I don't think so, Mr. Warren. He's a fine horseman. There he goes. I must say, he seems to be handling him well. Yes, he's... A... Say, he's heading for the wall. Hmm? He's going to jump the wall. No, he can't. Not an untrained horse. George! No! No! There he goes. He... Oh! He's strong! No! He's stomping him! He's... He's... <laughs> George is dead, isn't he, Peter? I'm afraid so, Helen. Mr. Warren rushed him into town to a doctor he knows, and he just phoned to say that George had passed away there without regaining consciousness. Oh. I should have gone with him. I just didn't feel up to it. Of course you didn't. You can't go anywhere until you're strong. Peter, do you think I'll ever be strong again? I'm sure you will, my dear. All you need is rest and quiet. It's terrible to say this, I know... But it will be more, more peaceful here now, now that George is gone. Won't it, Peter? Yes, I think it will. It will be a lot more peaceful here from now on. Dr. Starr. Oh, uh, Miss Hodges. The sedative is ready, Doctor. Uh, yes, thank you, nurse. Uh, Helen, uh, my dear, Miss Hodges is going to give you something to quiet your nerves so that you'll feel better in the morning. Thank you. Here you are. Drink it all down, Mrs. Warren. <laughs> That's fine. Now, lie back. Close your eyes. That's it. Come on, nurse. Leave her alone for a while. Yes, doctor. Mr. Warren has coffee waiting in the living room. Good. I could stand some coffee. sent me to my death. No, no, no. First it was your father, Helen. Then it was me, but I've come back to you, see? I've come back. Oh, no, go away. Go away. <laughs> 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 this calls for careful thinking, Margot. It might prove fatal. Lamont, why not just throw in your hands and admit that I'm a better Jim Romy player than you are? Huh. Cranston never gives up. <laughs> Besides, I'm going to win this game. There. <laughs> now, let's see what you can do with the tennis spades. Jim. Uh, Jim. Jim. Let's see. That puts me out with, um, 112. Oh. 112 to nothing. Sounds like Notre Dame versus Slippery Rock teachers. <laughs> You know, maybe we ought to try some other game. Oh, the doorbell. Now, who'd be calling at this hour? Yes? You must pardon the intrusion, but I was told I could find Mr. Cranston here. Lucius Warren, isn't it? Well, won't you come in, sir? Thank you. Oh, this is Margot Lane, Mr. Warren. How do you do, Mr. How do you Warren? Do? Mr. Warren and I met at the horse show last winter, Margot. His son, uh, George, wasn't it? Went home with most of the top prizes. Say, how is George? He's dead, Mr. Cranston. 
Oh, I'm sorry. He was thrown from a horse and trampled. A terrible shock. Yes, Mr. Kennison. Terrible shock. But a man of my age learns to... But it's his wife, Helen, I'm worried about. Worried? You see, her father died in precisely the same manner a short time ago. I see. Helen never quite got over it. She insists that George's ghost has appeared. She... Cranston, I... I need your help. My help, Mr. Warren? Uh, wouldn't a psychiatrist... We have a psychiatrist attending us. Dr. Stark. It's at his suggestion that I'm here now. I, I'm afraid I don't understand. This, uh... Ghost, Mr. Cranston. Helen swears she's seen it, heard it. Dr. Stark says if the situation continues, Helen will... Will... How dreadful. Uh, no one else at Roundville has seen or heard anything? No, no one. Because it's non-existent. Practically all ghosts have the same distinction. But I, I still don't see... Mr. Cranston, if you should tell Helen that the ghost isn't there... It might convince her, is that it? Yes, I see what he means. Then you'll come? Under the circumstances, I find it almost impossible to refuse. But I tell you, Mr. Cranston, I saw him. I saw George in this very room. Mrs. Warren, is it possible it could have been someone else? Someone no. who merely pretended to be George's ghost? No. It was George. I'm certain I'd know his voice anywhere. He was sneering at me, accusing me. Mr. Cranston, I'm afraid I must ask you to go now. Mrs. Warren is under a terrible strain. I realize that, Dr. Stark. I, I've just one more question. Mrs. Warren, you say the ghost was accusing you. Yes, yes, he was. Accusing you of what? Mr. Cranston, I'm afraid I can't allow my patient to answer that question at this particular time. Doctor, if I'm to be of any assistance, I must know the facts. Well, Mrs. Warren, of what did the ghost accuse you? He was in a vapor in a misty cloud. He sneered at me. He accused me. Of what? Of what? Of... I don't know. I don't know what he accused me of. I don't know. <laughs> I think you'd better leave now, Mr. Cranston. We can talk later in the library. Very well, Doctor. And we do have several things to talk about, wouldn't you say? Coffee, Miss Lane? Miss Hodges? Thank you, Mr. Warren. I'd like some. I have plenty. Mr. Cranston? No, none for me, then. I'll have another cup, if you don't mind. Yes, of course, Doctor. There you are, Doctor. Yeah. Is uh, Helen sleeping? Yes, I've given her a sedative. I'm afraid her interview with Cranston here was a trifle upsetting. I'm sorry. There were certain questions that were necessary. Well, in the future, I'd appreciate your asking me all the questions you find so necessary. I don't think that any of you realize just how close Helen is to a complete incurable breakdown. But she seems so much better the last few days, Doctor. When I require your medical opinions, nurse, I'll let you know. Oh. Meanwhile, I suggest that you go to your patient. Oh, surely Miss Hodges can drink her coffee first, Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Warren. I'll just take my coffee with me. Really, Stark, aren't you a little severe with Miss Hodges? Well, I suppose so. I didn't mean to be so irritable. It's just that this case baffles me. Uh, well, uh, uh, it's uh, late. I suggest we all retire. Yes, very good idea. I, I've suddenly become quite sleepy. Strange that I should get sleepy after two cups of coffee. Yes, Doctor. Most strange. Come on. They're on the floor. She's dead. Oh. Judging from those staring eyes, she's been frightened to death. <laughs> We'll 
return to the shadow in just a minute. A lot of Americans fought for it in the 18th century, 19th century, and just a couple of years ago in the Second World War. Fought for it and died for it. For what? Why, for the right of all American citizens to have a voice in saying how and by whom they shall be governed from large officers right on up to the president of these United States. Well, that's swell, you say. We're grateful. We wouldn't live in a land where we couldn't cast that secret ballot. We'll keep that right for ourselves and for our children, even if it means fighting for it again. And so, what do we do with this precious right to vote? Well, the last time we had a presidential election in these United States, just over half of the eligible voters took time out to go to the polls. What happened to the rest of us? Well, let's take the case of Joe Smith. He looked at it this way. After all, what difference does one vote make? I'm not going to swing the whole election with my vote, but it makes a lot of difference when you multiply that by several million Americans who had something more important to do on that particular day. You see, freedom carries with it a responsibility. And as the old saying goes, you never get something for nothing. Remember, freedom is everybody's job. Margot and Lamont have come to the Warren country home to investigate a strange ghost-like apparition of a man on horseback which has just taken another life in the Warren household. No. No, go away, go away. No. It's all right, Helen. It's all over. Yes. It's all over, Doctor. Except for discovering who murdered Nurse Hodges. Murdered, Mr. Cranston? She She was frightened to death, Mr. Warren. In the eyes of the law, any death directly caused by the commission of a crime is a homicide. Look here, Cranston, what are you suggesting? Dr. Stark, real ghosts, if there are such things, don't usually go around slipping drugs, sleep-inducing drugs into coffee pots. Trev? Exactly, Mr. Warren. So that we'd all be asleep while the ghost came calling on Mrs. Warren. But Miss Hodges drank coffee. Yet she was awake when the ghost appeared. The nurse's coffee is still here. Untouched. There's her cup right next to Dr. Stark's little box of sedatives. Wait a minute, Cranston. Are you implying that I put a drug in the coffee? I'm implying nothing, Doctor. And as for my assumption, it's a simple matter to find out if that coffee contains a drug. We'll have it analyzed at once. But, Cranston, why should... Doctor, look out. The nurse's coffee. You knocked it over. Oh, dear. How awkward of me. Yes, Doctor. Awkward is just the word I would use. Come, Margaret, walk me down to the mailbox, will you? The mailbox? Yes, I wrote a letter while I sat up waiting for our ghost last night. I'd like to mail it. While we're at it, we can drop over to the stables. High-spirited brute, isn't he, Margot? Vicious, you mean. It's easy, fellow, easy. Forgive me for dropping in so unexpectedly, Bruno, but we have a matter of murder to discuss. Easy. Steady, Bruno. Oh, steady. And tell him to be careful. Steady, Bruno. Steady, steady. Ah, steady, that's the boy. Easy. Just going to look at your shoe. Like this. Yeah, don't hurt a bit. I hope. Well. Did you find something? Yes, come here. Look at this. No, thanks. What is it? Steady, boy. It's mud on his shoe. Red clay, and it's fresh. Fresh clay? Yes. I saw a reddish brown field from my bedroom window. You did? Yes. Lamont, there's an old abandoned house house close to it. I saw that from my window, too. Fine. Now we can eliminate the middleman for the time being. Perhaps go directly to the source. What do you mean? I mean, Margaret, we're close on the heels of a ghost. Come on. Let's have a look at that house you saw from your window. It's a dismal-looking place, isn't it? Yes, there's certainly no answer to the housing shortage. Come on, let's go in. (gasps) What is it, Martha? Come on, a light. I can swear I saw a light through that door. Take it for an instant and then went out. Come on, someone's in there. Cigarette smoke. Someone's in here, all right. Light you saw flicker must have been a match. Come on. 
Over there. There's something moving. Steady, Marco. I'll go see. Oh, it's just an old piece of wallpaper hanging from the wall. Oh. Lamont. It's flapping. Someone must have opened the door. Lamont. Something's grabbing ah! Margo! heard something in here. Uh, What's this? The eminent psychiatrist talking to himself? <laughs> what? Who's that? I don't see anyone. You can conserve your flashlight battery, Dr. Stark. No one sees the shadow. The shadow? Miss Lane, doctor, what did you do with her? Miss Lane, I... I... You found her, doctor. You'll answer to the shadow. But I haven't seen Miss Lane. I swear. Explain I... what you're doing here in this house, then, doctor. I saw a light. And, and I, I, I thought I'd Dr. see... Dr. Stark, tell me what you know of the doings at Roundville. Who's behind it all? All right, I'll tell you. It's... Window. Down. Get out! Dr. Stark. Doctor, who did this? Who did it? I... I found... His... His hiding place. I found out... What was going on. It's... It's... Oh... A letter, Miss Lane. What was in that letter mailed from Roundville? I don't know. What was in the letter Cranston mailed from Roundville? I insist that you tell me. And I insist that you untie me, Mr. Warren. Untie you, Miss Lane? Really, I'm afraid you don't appreciate the situation. We have drama here, Miss Lane. And suspense. And perhaps violence. You're insane. No, Miss Lane. Helen's the one who's insane. You know Helen. She's my daughter-in-law. It's all part of the plan, you see. Plan? What plan, Mr. Warren? The letter, Miss Lane. What did Cranston have to say? I tell you, I don't know. I don't know. You mean you've forgotten, don't you, Miss Lane? conveniently forgotten. That's all right. I have a way of refreshing your memory. Oh, what are you going to do? I'll show you. Curling iron. Red hot and ready to use. Oh. Wonderful stimulant for absent-minded girls. No, no. I'm afraid I'll have to use it. Unless you decide to tell me about the letter. But I don't know. No. no. Don't come any closer. No. You heard what she said, Warren. Oh. Who's there? I'm close by you, Warren. Oh, the chef. Put that iron down, Warren. Put it down, I say. It was a clever scheme, wasn't it, Warren? A daring plan. What do you mean? Your plan to drive Helen insane. You were the one who put the drug in the coffee so that everyone would sleep through the ghost's appearance. Everyone except Helen, of course. No, you're wrong. First you tried to make her believe she murdered her father, didn't you, Warren? No, I... Then when that I... failed to drive her mad, you hit upon this plan, didn't you? A ghostly plan to deprive her of her sanity. And all because you were greedy. That's not true. Everyone thought the aristocratic Warrens were rich. No one but you and your son knew that it was Helen who had the money. And you knew that if Helen were declared insane, her husband would gain legal control of her fortune. Her husband? But he's dead. George is dead. Is he? <laughs> Look here. All right, come out. You don't have to pretend to be dead and a ghost any longer. George, uh, how did they find you? Where am I? What happened? You just received a little tap on the head, George. You'll recover. Which is more than can be said for Dr. Stark lying upstairs dead with your bullets in him. Shadow. You hurt, George. You hurt my son. He's got a gun. I'll kill you. Drop that gun, Warren. I'll kill you. Father, I'm in your line of... I've killed him. My son. I've killed him. And this time it's real. The evil suffer by their own wicked devices, Warren. <laughs> Margot, 
<laughs> Here's a card I'm sure you can't have any possible use for. Gin. 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 Lamont, there's one thing that still bothers me. Oh, it's your deal. Hmm. Well, what bothers you? The vapor. The misty cloud around the ghost. Oh, I was onto that from the beginning, Margot. Dry ice. Dry ice? Mm-hmm. When dry ice is immersed in water, it vaporizes. Uh, carbon dioxide vapor. Oh. Well, how do you account for the fact that neither Dr. Stark nor Helen saw the supposed body of George nor went to the supposed doctor's office? Well, Helen was ill with shock. Dr. Stark was at her bedside. <laughs> oh, this is what I call a good hand. Thank you. My pleasure. Isn't it nice to see Helen worn up and around and well again? Yeah, it certainly is nice. It's had a terrible experience. Lamont, why did Mr. Warren come to see you in the first place? Oh, he was afraid Dr. Stark wouldn't uh, accept the apparition. He had to have an outside authority to be a witness to his son's ghost. Hmm. Well, there's just one more thing. Hmm? What one more thing? What letter you mailed. The one Warren almost killed me for. What was in it? Oh, that. Well, I'd been forgetting to mail it for days. I uh, merely mentioned it as a means of stirring up someone's suspicious nature. I, I actually did send away for something. Ah, here. <laughs> Giving you the six of hearts. Jim. 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 What did you send away for, Lamont? A book. A book? What book? It's called How to Win at Gin Rummy. <laughs> <laughs> Return to the shadow in just a moment. In its highest meaning, American citizenship implies respect for the dignity of man, man the individual. It has long been a basic American belief that the essential good in men will beat down the bad, but only if the individual is afforded wide latitude in working out his own problems. There is something extremely positive about all this, but don't let anyone twist the thing around. Don't let anyone tell you that in being an American, you are not being something else. Professional patriots invariably employ this trick. Next thing you know, you're an anti-capitalist, anti-socialist, anti-foreign, or anti-a half a dozen things. Free, intelligent individuals have no difficulty arriving at sane, satisfactory conclusions. Whether Frenchmen or Chinese, Christians or Jews, employers or workers, white or black, free men are strong men. And a nation of free men is a strong nation. Now back to the shadow. This story is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. All names and places are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Listen again next week, same time, same station, when the shadow will again demonstrate that the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow. <laughs> Next week, same time, same station, another strange and thrilling adventure in the shadow's daring battle against the forces of evil. Suppose you are driving along peacefully and suddenly one of those extra loud horns is blasted at you by an impatient driver who's in a hurry to get around you or make you hustle up too. Does it get your goat? Well, that's understandable. But let them blow their horns. Let them pass you. Let them have the right of way if need be. Let them live and keep living yourself. The part of Lamont Cranston was played by Brett Morrison, Margot by Grace Matthews. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs> 